Okay, so in this video we're going to do a quick uh, introduction or review, depending on who you are, to the concept of monetary neutrality, which is one of the key concepts that uh, introduces what we call one of the big debates between economists on how valuable is monetary policy, how well does it actually work, and um, how available really is it to governments uh, to use money and the money supply to affect the economy. So uh, the best way to think about this is to break down our discussions of monetary policy into two different questions. Uh, the first is what we have been studying about monetary policy for a while. How does an increase in the money supply affect the interest rate, price level, and real output in the short run? Uh, that's largely going to be a review of things we've already done in our units on monetary policy. And then what we're going to add to that is how does this increase in the money supply affect the interest rate, price level, and output in the long run? Uh, in other words, are the consequences or the effects of monetary policy still valid in the long run? So to dive in, let's do uh, a quick review of something we've done before. What is the short run effect of an increase in the money supply? So we can start here and we can say, let's increase our money supply. Uh, there, of course, are three Federal Reserve tools or central bank tools that we could use to do that. We could buy bonds, we could lower the reserve ratio, or we could lower the discount rate. Uh, any of the above would increase this money supply and shift it out to the right to get us to MS2. And we would then see the interest rate would fall to R2. So first relationship here, an increase in the money supply leads to a decrease in interest rates. This decrease in interest rates, though, can then be carried over to our ADAS model. The decrease in interest rates is going to increase what is called interest-sensitive spending. Uh, primarily, we're talking here about business investment spending, I, and consumer spending, C. When interest rates fall, businesses and consumers are more likely to engage in purchasing because borrowing money becomes cheaper. I and C are both a part of AD, so we can say that the lower interest rate will increase I and C, which will increase aggregate demand, and we can move over and look for the increase in AD to AD2, and then we can read on this graph that we have moved to Y2 and PL2, and so we can say that the increase in aggregate demand has led to an increase in real GDP, an increase in price level, and using real GDP, we can determine there's been a decrease in the unemployment rate. All of these, of course, are the short-run consequences of this policy. So in the short run, increases in the money supply, lower interest rates, which lead to these expansionary effects on the economy in the short run. That's what we've all covered already before in earlier units and earlier discussions. The question now becomes, what happens to this economy as we move into the long run? How does the long run look different from the short run as we put this together? And for this, we actually have to start almost working our way backwards. We're going to start over here with the problem in our ADAS model. And that is that this model, of course, is now in an expansionary gap or an inflationary gap, depending on the language that you prefer to use. And in this case, it's both. We certainly have a higher level of inflation and a higher level of output. So we begin the process here of self-correction. Self-correction says that, in particular, the low rate of unemployment is going to lead to an increase in wages over time. Uh, as we enter the long run, employees, uh, seeing the shortage of workers available in the market, are able to negotiate higher wages from their bosses. The increase in wages represents an increase in input costs for suppliers. And our supply curve, our SRAS, will then decrease. So we move our supply curve over to the left to get us back into this long-run equilibrium. 
and we can begin to have our first conclusions here where we begin to see that we have come back to YP or potential output. So GDP has decreased from its previous increase and is now unchanged in the long run. Unemployment is also unchanged in the long run as it is returned with GDP to that original output level or we have returned with GDP to that original output level. And most importantly, we see that the only true effect occurring here is that we have increased our price level. And that is the permanent consequence here. Uh, the last thing we can do with this is we can say that this increase in price level is going to carry back into our money market and rising price level will lead to a rising money demand or a rising transaction demand for money, which is going to push our interest rate back to or even potentially above its original level from the short run. And so uh, let's jump down. We'll clean all this up and get to what the big consequences or big conclusions we have are from all of these changes. So if we reset up our graph and work our way through this one more time, we put the nominal interest rate versus the quantity of money, a downward sloping money demand and a vertical money supply. We put price level versus real GDP, a downward sloping aggregate demand. And in this case, we're going to drop in that because we only care about the long run, we're only going to drop in an LRAS curve here. We're going to ignore our short run supply because we only care about the long run. Uh, this is the model that we sometimes see referred to as classical model of price, uh, also model preferred for long run analysis in problems that jump us directly to the long run. So what happens if we increase the money supply in the long run? We say an increase in the money supply leads to, at first, a decrease in interest rates, and therefore the increase in aggregate demand. But if we are looking only at the long run, then this leads to an increase in price level, but no change to unemployment or real GDP output, and that the increase in price level leads to an increase in money demand, which can return and show us no real effect on interest rates. And we, of course, have to make sure we say that these are all, most importantly, long-run consequences of changing the money supply, or in this case, increasing the money supply. Let's conclude this and just wrap this up and, and kind of get to our final conclusion here. Uh, so the definition then of monetary neutrality is in many ways exactly what it sounds like. If we say that money is neutral, we're saying that changes in the money supply have no real effects on the economy. They only lead to changes in price level. And real effects include changes to GDP, changes to unemployment or employment, changes to interest rates, and also changes to wages. So that's monetary neutrality, one of the biggest concepts and most complex concepts used uh, by the AP exam. Um, and most importantly, one of the most important limitations that classical and many neoclassical economists bring to discussions of monetary policy, claiming that the money supply, because money itself is only a medium of exchange, cannot actually affect the way the economy functions in the long run. It can only affect the prices at which the economy functions over time.